Right, we're now live, up and running. Uh, this is all technology stuff. Now, I have the pleasure, uh, and I hope it will be mutual, of about nine lectures uh, with you over the next two or three weeks, which I'm rather looking forward to. We'll be covering quite a range of stuff, and that's the list up there. Um, we start off with a bit of stuff around thermoregulation today, uh, which is interesting, and then we'll move along to hormones. And I think most of the second lecture will be around hormones and hormone action at a cellular level or uh, close to cellular level. Then we'll talk a bit about metabolism, and that will bring us back again to thermoregulation. Um, and then that will deal with those issues uh, in that circle. And then we'll move on to the gut or as medical students prefer to call it, the GIT. I've never quite shaken off my zoological background, so you'll have to pardon me uh, when I call it the, the gut rather than GIT. Uh, and those the sh that's the shape of the lectures. And it will more or less run to that shape, um, I hope, uh, depending on student union elections and other such uh, distractions. Throughout these lectures, I shall be talking about uh, emphasising the basic mechanisms that are involved. Keep it at a nice, simple level. I'm a simple chap. Don't get too clever for me, otherwise you'll leave me behind. Um, so, and I'll illustrate that by patho pathophysiological examples from time to time. So, uh, and that is a great way, because pathophysiology is a natural experiment of what happens when things go wrong. So that's, uh, they're, they're useful to look at. For you, you need to remember what they illustrate, not just the example. It is an example, so you have to remember the underlying process, and that's what you're there for. You'll be sick of uh, feedback loops by this stage, I hope. Uh, they should be ingrained into your way of thinking. We should be talking about feedback loops endlessly, as physiologists do. Um, what happens when it all goes wrong? Well, with any luck, uh, you'll have uh, podcasts uh, and you'll have those available. They normally take about an hour to go up, to go live after the lecture. A whole hour. Fantastic, isn't it? Fantastic. I press a little button in this theatre and it whizzes off somewhere. <coughs> or in the case of last Thursday, it didn't whiz off anywhere because there was a crash on a server somewhere. <coughs> um, but it whizzes off into the ether and it appears on a site. Now, this is still at the developmental stage. It's advanced hugely in a year. So the, the software at this end is terrific. Whatever about the wetware, the software is terrific. Uh, the wetware is me, you understand. Um, the software is great, um, but the access from your point of view is still only developing. So uh, what you do is you go, you go to this site and you will find subscribe via iTunes, and that's what you do. But you can only do it on your own machines and only in college at the moment. Right? So, who knows, by the end of this lecture series, it may all be different. Um, so uh, if you have problems, uh, work it out. And no doubt you've got friends who've got laptops, so once you've got it on one, no doubt you can zap it onto your iPads. I must say, I think it's quite delightful that you might go to sleep with my voice muttering away <laughs> gently in your ear about defecation or something. <laughs> um, however, um, that's a thought which you could treasure for a little while. Um, the lecture slides will be available. <coughs> Uh, and I'm uh, sticking to my in principle policy of making them available after lectures. I know you like to have them before lectures, but we can discuss that in another place if you like. Um, but you will get them. They are available. Today's lectures have two errors, one of which is important but blindingly obvious, which I may even notice as we go through, and the second one is trivial. And therefore, I'm not obvious. It's a figure number on one of the figures, and I'll pick it up as we go on. Mm -hmm. If all else fails, uh, for physios, by the way, uh, if you, there should be a link to this site from your site. I've asked for one to be put up uh, just to stop me having to write down two URLs. Uh, so there should be a link. If there isn't, let me know and I'll chase it. Uh, if all else fails, send me an email. Now, if all 200 of you send me an email, I may weep. Um, I certainly won't answer 200 emails, but I'll do my best. Um, and otherwise you know where I am, or some of you do. Okay. So we should get along fairly swimmingly. Um, so let's talk about thermoregulation. Uh, normally this kind of slide will be my first slide for each lecture. So it will show the... Oops. Excuse me a moment. 
Um, I will normally show the learning outcomes for this lecture. Now, those are listed. Actually, are they in your course manual? I can't now remember. If they're not in your course manual, they're from what I hope will be your course manual next year that I've written already. If I've changed the wording, it's only because I want to squash it into a smaller space. So that's how that works. So the sequence of the lecture is shown in this case on the left. We talk about body temperature, basal metabolic rate, and one or two other little concepts in there. We talk about heat production and heat loss. This is a typical tuffery way of looking at the universe as input-output. So we can think of heat as being in a compartment. It's a commodity. You've got heat in, you've got heat out. So what you have in the middle is the bit that you're trying to regulate. It's a physiological variable. We're trying to maintain it within a particular fairly narrow range, which we'll look at. And we'll look at the various, some of the mechanisms for doing that. We talk about heat loss, and we talk about regulation. Uh, we won't talk about extremes today. I don't know why we won't, but uh, we won't. Um, we might do that on another day. <laughs> Excuse me. Right. Uh, so we talk about body temperature, the temperature of the physical mass of the body. So those of you who are very good at physics will be able to think of this as a mass with a particular coefficient of heat and all of that sort of stuff. We talk about core temperature, and that's how we indicate Tc, subscript C, for the core temperature. And that's the usual thing. Now we can measure that as uh, the external auditory meatus, the ear, stick a little... Uh, thermistor in the ear, gently, uh, and you can measure something approaching core temperature, approximately the temperature of your brain inside you, if you stick a probe in the ear, uh, which is why it's used now clinically much more than other things, or experimentally the esophageal temperature. Um, external, I will normally just refer to core temperature. It doesn't, for our purposes, it doesn't matter how we measure it. It remains reasonably con constant, around 37.8. Uh, I see our textbook uses some wonderfully archaic unit of measurement, ray or more, or something like that. 37.8 uh, is the right answer, please, uh, approximately. And it goes up and down by nearly 2 degrees during the course of the day. So when you rise in the morning, it's relatively low because you've been relatively uh, inactive. Uh, you haven't been doing great digestive and metabolic work particularly, so um, your body temperature should be fairly low at that point. Uh, as you generate more energy during the day and more heat and more exercise and so on, you will generate more heat and your body temperature will rise. There's a separate uh, cycle imposed on that diurnal cycle. Uh, that's the, the menstrual cycle, which affects about 50% of us. Um, not of us, about 75% of us. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's a cycle of about uh, plus or minus one degree, uh, which is fairly small in the scale of things. Uh, discuss the applications and non-applications of that one. Um, the advantage of having a relatively high body temperature, and for most of us, it's considerably higher than ambient temperature. That's to say the temperature in the rest of the universe about us. This morning, uh, certainly when I got up, it was about five degrees uh, outside. So my little thermometer told me. I didn't like to find out. Uh, it feels a bit colder than up in the college park this morning. So it's around five degrees. We're running at about 30 plus degrees higher than that. For some of you, uh, you run at your ambient temperature is about the same as your body temperature, at least at some times of the year. Uh, and all these things are a bit different. Uh, but if you maintain your body temperature up at about uh, 30, 40 degrees, getting up to 40 degrees, say 30 degrees higher than ambient temperature most of the year round in this kind of latitude. Now, what's the advantage of that? Biochemical processes work now. Can I get it right? It's called the Q10, or it used to be called the Q10. That's to say, for every 10 degree rise, your biochemistry will work twice as fast. So work it out. Two, four, eight times. Eight times faster than if you were dead. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Um, the advantage, disadvantage of that is that it costs you to maintain that. It costs energy input. So some of your food, lots of your food that you take in, is required to maintain your body temperature. And other elements, uh, are there other ways of maintaining body temperature. So that it costs you to make maintain your body temperature. So some species, for example, indeed some human beings, can allow their body temperature to drop. I've forgotten which way around it is now. It's either the Tierra del Fuegans 
or the uh, Australian, are they called, you're not allowed to call them Aborigines anymore probably, uh, the Australian Aborigines um, uh, can allow their body temperature to drop and do so at night. So they go to sleep on, and they're in a place where body uh, air temperature falls very dramatically and then they can allow their body temperature to drop, not to ambient temperature, but quite a long way. Now it's a very efficient way of uh, saving on fuel because you're not maintaining your body temperature for about a third of the day or at least maintaining it at a lower level so you're economising on food so it's a very efficient mechanism for those I wish I could remember which way around they were but there you go so what are the limits on body temperature? well the upper limit is around 42 degrees because at 42 degrees proteins start to coagulate and since all the important molecules in your body are proteins <coughs> all your enzymes are proteins your body temperature rises and it gets up to anywhere near uh, 42. Proteins start to do very strange things and you start to uh, go quietly to pieces or possibly not very quietly to pieces because one of the things that happens is you can no longer regulate brain uh, neuronal activity and you get convulsions. So uh, pretty dramatic stuff if you get it there. Conditions in which you get this in endogen endogenous fevers generated particularly in young small persons and the temperature just rockets and they can go into convulsions and get very peculiar looking uh, very quickly. Quite dangerous and very dramatic. Lower temperature, well you can drop your body temperature uh, reasonably low for a short period. Hence our Australian indigenes, uh, they can drop their body temperature for six or eight hours uh, with no ill effects. And just as the ambient temperature rises, they can just uh, resurrect and gently come round. Uh, and get warm again. So that's perfectly all right. So it just reduces the metabolic activity. The Q10 drops. So you're just reducing the, the rate of biochemical activity. Not great if you're being chased by a saber toothed tiger. Um, poor old saber toothed tiger always gets invoked into these things. But there we are. So you, there is a, a range. So you can reduce it. Now you can't freeze your body uh, in a normal course of events. If you freeze, you will die because you'll form ice crystals and your tissues will be destroyed, including your brain. This is a very simple diagram. I think there might even be a multiple choice question, which is, you know, probably the answer is E, all of the above, wouldn't you think? What are the ways that heat is exchanged in the body? One, radiation, two, convection, three, whatever they are, conduction, four, evaporation, and D, all of the above. E, all of the above. When in doubt, if you really don't know, always go for E. <laughs> if, you, if you have no idea whatsoever, go for E, always. Um, the other rule of multiple choice questions is when in doubt, go for the longest answer. If you know absolutely nothing, pick the longest answer. Now we've got acute to that now. We started to write some long distractors, but it, it's not a bad general rule. If all else fails, that will do. If you get down to counting the number of letters in the words, it doesn't matter. Use a pin. It'll be quicker. Um, right. Inputs and outputs. Uh, a way I like to look at these things. Uh, the input to the body temperature, how do you generate heat? Metabolism. Now, metabolism, depending on what you read, uh, where you read it, uh, is around 50% efficient. 50% efficient. Now, what does that mean? It means that for every unit of energy used <coughs> to generate metabolic work, one unit of heat is generated. That's the waste from metabolism, is heat. As it happens, we've got a way of using it. We're using it to raise our body temperature, so we're super efficient. So metabolism is about 50%, at best, 50% efficient. So for every one unit of work you use, you get one unit of heat. Compare that muscles. Loads of seats down here, dear boy, if you want to come down. Uh, I'm not splashing that far today, uh, but I might. Um, muscles, on the other hand, are only 25% efficient. Now, this is important, as we'll see in the next couple of slides. 25% efficient. Now, do your sums, think it out. That means for every one unit of mechanical work you get from your muscles, you get three units of heat. Right? 25% is one of four, that efficient one, three inefficient ones. So that means muscle is a very efficient way of generating heat. So we're looking at it through a mirror today. We're looking at muscle as a heat generator. We're not interested from our point of view today, as muscle, as a work generator, heat generator. So it's very efficient. Um, you will notice that. Um, we'll talk about that when we talk about shivering. And here's our little friend, 
uh, showing this uh, northern latitude biased uh, diagram uh, where the sun generates heat and warms you up uh, and a fire warms you up. You generate uh, heat to other objects in your environment uh, and you conduct through to external objects. That only works if the external object is cooler than you are. Yeah. So if you happen to be in a hot environment where they're not cooler than you are, it would warm you up. But then you know that when you think about it. And then you can have extraordinary things. You could pick up a snowball. Some of us will know what, almost nobody here will know what a snowball is, except the Canadians, I suspect, who do know about <laughs> snowballs. Uh, the rest of us uh, haven't been a snowball, I think, in Ireland since about 1982, at least not at uh, sea level, not in Dublin. Um, and where else matters, after all? Um, <laughs> Naturally, we dubs are all the same. If you like that one. Um, you can have a little heating pad. That's a little special picture for the physios. Uh, sore shoulder. Air will cool you down by moving over it. And sweating. Uh, this is the technical term, by the way. Um, you will all know, being properly read. Uh, what is it? Horses sweat, men perspire, young ladies merely glow. <laughs> so please try to remember that one. <laughs> Obviously never met any. <laughs> right. Uh, so that's what we were always told when I was a young fellow. Probably came to Christmas cracker. Right. Uh, but sweating is the technical term. It's the physiological term. So if you find it, as the more refined among you may, uh, mildly offensive, then I'm sorry about that. And we have to be technical. So there are the outputs, and we talked about those. Notice that radiation occurs over the skin. Right. So that depends upon temperature gradient. And it would depend upon the flow of heat to the skin. Flow of blood to the skin, carrying heat. So we, we can regulate that. We'll see how that works in a moment. And evaporation by sweat. So it is not efficient to mop your brow if you're sweating. You're much more efficient to fan yourself and evaporate the sweat and cool. That's what you should do. So if you're dripping, of course, you're wasting the sweating. So try not to drip. That's my best advice to you. <laughs> right, uh, heat production, uh, the metabolism, the, the rate of metabolism in the body is regulated. Now, it's, it can be regulated in the short term, but it's mainly regulated in long term metabolism. And the thyroid hormones are the key hormones for that. They affect most of the cells in the body uh, and they can tweak up, they, and they act to tweak up the metabolism. So, if you have an excess of thyroid hormone, you will have a higher metabolism uh, and you'll probably tend to lose body weight. Whereas if you have a low uh, output of thyroid hormones, pathologically low one, you'll tend to be cooler and you'll tend to accumulate body weight. So you'll be a, a damp round person as to a skinny dry person, uh, more or less. Shivering is a very efficient way of generating heat. We live in such a mollycoddled environment, we almost never uh, feel the need to shiver. But I can certainly remember when I was a lad when we used to go swimming, uh, both indoors and outdoor pools. Uh, and I can remember, I don't, you've probably never seen this phenomenon, it's quite extraordinary. It only happens in lads of uh, about eight, I think, uh, maybe a bit older. Have you ever seen anybody's knees going up and down as they shiver? They really, kneecaps go up and down like this. Absolutely wonderful effect. The little quads lit into spasm, the shivery spasms. Uh, really quite spectacular. Once seen, never forgotten. Usually associated with blue skin, by the way, this um, particular thing. It's quite a spectacular thing. I remember it well. Uh, so shivering is the uncoordinated contraction of skeletal muscle. Uncoordinated because it doesn't produce any useful work. There is no real movement. Wiggling your kneecaps up and down is not useful work. It's not like standing up and moving around. Um, so it produces little work and much heat. Now, there's an intermediate stage before you get to shivering, and many of you may have experienced that this morning because um, it's a pretty nippy old morning, and if you were standing waiting for your means of public transport or, your, or uh, the chauffeur to bring the limo round, <laughs> and I know it's hard to get good staff, isn't it? It's terrible. <laughs> um, while you were waiting, you may have found yourself sort of tensing up like so, bringing the shoulders up a little bit, uh, I could call seeing some half-naked young one uh, on Thursday evenings <coughs> I was leaving college. You know, these young women who don't wear anything these days and expect to stay warm and healthy. Um, and she was clearly underdressed, but she was walking around, oh, 
<laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that bad on Thursday, you know. Uh, but that's a, an increase in muscle tone, partial state of contraction of the muscle. And that generates heat quite effectively because muscle is very inefficient in terms of work. So it's quite a nice mechanism. Here's the shivering pathway then. You've got central thermoreceptors, heat receptors, temperature receptors uh, around the hypothalamus, and they're detecting core temperature. So that's good. They're stuck in the middle of your brain. They detect core temperature. Um, and there are others in the central nervous system and the abdominal organs, as you see. Uh, and you've also got skin receptors. And they're picking up, obviously, the temperature of the skin, which is a couple of degrees normally, a couple of degrees lower uh, than core temperature, as you might expect. Again, depending on ambient temperature. Then there's an integrating centre in the hypothalamus called the thermoregulatory integrating centre. Now, that wasn't hard, was it? You've worked that out. <coughs> uh, and the effectors are then motor neurons, which innovate muscle, and the skeletal muscle. So, if you're cold, you activate motor neuron neurons, get the muscles going and generate lots of heat. So that's the shivering pathway. Now there's almost nothing in there that you couldn't work out from first principles. Core temperature is the key variable, so you need some receptors in, this, in the central part of the body. Abdominal receptors, CNS, hypothalamus. When in doubt, put the hypothalamus down for all these regulatory functions. Skin receptors, you know you have skin receptors and you can feel that and you can test skin yourself. And there's bound to be an integrating centre somewhere. Now, there is a as well as shivering, there is a mechanism of heat generation called non-shivering thermogenesis. Now, there's not very much ab about this in the textbook because it's relatively new. Not terribly new, but relatively new. And the principal organ, if we may call it that, or certainly tissue, is brown fat. Now, most of the fat in our body is of a type known as white fat. White fat, because grossly it looks white. But this particular kind of fat, which occurs in specific locations, is called brown fat because it looks brown when you inspect it. Um, now, Richie Porter, have you come across Richie Porter from biochemistry? Yeah, yeah lovely, isn't he? Yes? Oh, all right, please yourselves. <laughs> Richie's all right. Richie's a brown fat person, among other things. He knows about brown fat. Encourage him a bit. He'll talk to you about brown fat and uncoupling proteins. Anyway, I'm not going to talk to you about all of that. But what happens in there is there's a genetic defect in one of these uncoupling proteins. And if you get that, it generates heat. Now, some uh, of this heat, um, some of these proteins can be affected genetically and maybe are causes of some kinds of obesity. So it's a genetic defect, an enzyme defect in brown fat, can be a cause of some types of obesity because you can't process heat in the right way. And if you do, as you will see later, when you, if you can't handle your energy properly, then it may accumulate uh, as fat in the body. It's not the permanent excuse for all of us who are a bit chubby, um, but it is, it, it is for some, and it's testable. Uh, now, brown fat is mediated by thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, and by the sympathetic nervous system, adrenaline and noradrenaline. There we are. How important is it in humans? Well, it's very important in newborns because they can't shiver. Newborns can't shiver because their <coughs> nerves are not sufficiently developed. So we probably know from common knowledge that you have to keep small children reasonably warm. They cannot thermoregulate very well. So here's the distribution of fat on this rather strange-looking infant. And I've lost the reference. Looks as like the face has been put on from somebody else, doesn't it? Really quite extraordinary <laughs> face. I might get rid of that. Uh, there's the fat. It's around the shoulders and down around the pericardium and the front of the chest. Useful spot <coughs> around there. Blood to the brain is going up around there and the heart is around there. If you can't keep anything else going, try at least to keep your heart going and keep the blood to your brain at a reasonable temperature and then you might uh, manage to survive. You get the... In the interscapular fat pad there between the shoulder blades and two little patches around the kidneys. Cat, if you're going to metabolise, you better have your kidneys working. So there, the, there is the brown fat. So it's important. There. Now for many years, uh, everybody, everybody meaning, I suppose, physiologists and medical type persons said, oh, well, brown fat, no, no, there's no brown fat in human beings. And then somebody thought to ask a pathologist and say, oh, yes, there's always brown fat. Ask the people who know. It's a good thing. 
It's like designing lecture theatres. You know, put the lectern as far away as possible from the computer. <laughs> Don't ask somebody you might know. Uh, so can be involved in some obesities. And in hibernating animals, I put that in square brackets because you're not going to be asked about hibernating animals. It's all right. I'll do my Richard Attenborough bit now. Um, but just think about the brown fat there. If you're a hibernating animal, what would you like to be? Would you like to be a bear? All right, you're a hibernating bear. It's winter time. There's millions of uh, probably feet of snow because it'd be North America. Uh, it'd be meters for the rest of us, or in the case of Dublin, millimeters. Um, no need to hibernate. Um, so the bear is there. It's hibernating and it's going to wake up. It gets whatever signal it is, a rise in ambient temperature or something that tells it to wake up. Now, as soon as you wake up, you've got to keep your, get your heart going. So the pericardial fat pad, pad warms the heart <coughs> up, up around the carotids, jugulars, whatever you have in yourself, those tubes that go up in your neck. Uh, you've got brown fat around there. It'll warm that. So your brain is now up, running, and able to do all its normal regulatory things. So your physiology is working, and your renal brown fat is getting your kidneys working, and so you're now able to metabolise and you can deal with the waste products of metabolism. So it's a very nifty system. A little squirt of noradrenaline, and off the whole lot go. It's really quite traumatic. So, brown fat. So it works. That's roughly how it works. <coughs> now, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, heat loss. Uh, the principal mechanism, mechanism of heat loss, vasodilatation in the skin and sweating. I'm leaving aside social mechanisms and things. You can think about those for yourself. Here's a block diagram of the skin, which I might even have shown you before, but it's so long ago. Do you remember that first week in college? You don't want to go there, do you? No, you're right. Um, here's the skin. That's the outer surface. There's some bits of hair sticking out through it. The area I'm concerned with is this area here. Okay? So where you've got the up-pushings of the connective tissue up against the living cells of the skin. They're the dermal papillae. Uh, and in those dermal papillae, you get little loops coming off arterioles. These are arterioles in here. And they make a little loop close to the surface, and then they obviously down into the vein. So the capillary loop there with rapid exchange and flow. Now you have a system where you can very precisely regulate the flow of blood close to the surface of the body. So you're probably ahead of me already. So by increasing the flow, arterioles, remember, are the ones with smooth muscles in they're the key regulating vessels for, the, for the blood flow. Small vessels, don't have names, but they do have smooth muscle and they are regulated. So if you dilate the arteriole, you will increase the blood flow to the skin. Your skin will get hotter, it will get pinker, uh, it may get bright redder. I'm, I'm scarlet, <laughs> if you speak North Dub. Uh, there you are. So there you are, you get. Uh, vastly increased blood flow and you get vastly increased heat loss. Right. So that's the normal mechanism for regulating heat loss over the body. In fact, it's the principal thermoregulatory mechanism. So most of the time we can manage with just this mechanism, just by regulating the flow of blood to our skin in that way and we can lose heat. So you know that. If you exercise fairly seriously, then you'll get an increased blood flow to your skin, your skin gets hot, it gets redder, uh, and then uh, and you don't look quite as glamorous as you did before, but it's terribly good for you. Right. So there we are. Uh, and of course you've got a competing demand in exercise, as we'll talk about later on, between the blood flow to the skin and the blood flow to the muscles. Now you have a problem, because you need to lose heat, but you need to keep working. So you get a trade-off, but we'll see, talk about that much later on. So regulation of flow by the arterioles up to about six-fold increase. So an increase of six, six-fold of blood there. Uh, and the sympathetic nervous system would cause the vasoconstriction, thereby reducing that, uh, reducing flow to the skin. Sorry, let me just go back a bit. Um, there's a nice little experiment you can do. Uh, I can't remember whether you actually get to do these things in the lab, where you immerse your hand in bowls of water at various temperatures. Have you done that in the lab, some of you? No, you haven't done that. Oh, you could try this at home. Perfectly safe. Better if you use somebody else's hand because. Uh, and you can put your if you put your hand in warm water, you can get vasodilatation. Now you can't really tell unless you've got a thermistor to measure it. But if you put your hand in cold water, stick a few ice cubes in, 
bring the temperature of the water down to about you know, five. And you put your hand in there and leave it there for a good while. You, this is a good thing to do with kid brothers, really. You know, don't resist the temptation to do it with their heads. Just use their hands. <laughs> and put their hand in and wait. And the hand gets colder and colder and colder. It may get quite unpleasant, but that's good for them. The little brothers, I mean. But after a while, the hand will get warm again. Isn't that an interesting reaction? The temperature hasn't changed, but it gets warm again. Why? Because you've got the risk of tissue damage. You've really shut down blood flow to the skin and what little bit of muscle there is down there. So metabolites gradually accumulate in the tissue, even though the temperature is dropping. They will accumulate. Those metabolites will act locally on the arterioles and they will cause vasodilatation. So if you were to measure that with a nice recording apparatus, you could show the skin temperature going up and down with time, although you're keeping the ambient temperature the same. A hunting phenomenon, that's called. Anyway, I thought I'd just treat you to that one. Right. Now, normally, uh, we are in our thermoneutral zone, and this is where the error is in the slides. I have written the ambient temperature range 20 to 20. This is pretty blindingly obviously wrong. Right? It's 20 to 30, approximately. So I've corrected it in this slide, but it's gone in to press with the other one. I won't bother. I've told you about it. Uh, and it should be pretty obvious that it's not right. Um, there's the ambient temperature in a range of about, about 20 to 30 degrees. That's about the extreme ends of the range. We can regulate our body temperature by regulating the <coughs> blood flow to, our, to the skin. So that's the normal range. Skin vasomotor responses are sufficient to maintain it. Uh, when you get below 20 degrees, you need to tweak your metabolism up, and if it gets much below that, you'll start to shiver or increase your muscle tone. Um, at your uh, an ambient temperature of greater than 30 degrees, I should have subscripted both of those, um, or three of them, uh, then you get sweating coming in at 30 degrees. These days, most of us travel a fair bit, or most of you travel a fair bit, uh, and you know what it's like in warm, humid countries, uh, where the normal re thermoregulatory response is to go to the bank for half an hour. There's the one air-conditioned building in the town, usually. Depends where you go. Uh, when you go into the bank and cool down for a bit, and then you come back out and sweat again. Uh, and, of course, you've got all sorts of uh, fluid problems. And here's a graph which summarises this. Uh, oh, sorry, I've crashed it on top of the, um, the writing there. There's the thermoneutral zone, where your, your metabolism cost is... It's, nothing or no increase in metabolism cost. Once you're outside your uh, critical temperatures, your lower critical temperature, then you get shivering and increased metabolism kicking in, measured as oxygen consumption, and at the higher critical temperature, then you need to tweak up the metabolism because you've got to generate sweat and so on. So various other things uh, doing that. Of course, there are other mechanisms that we use, and indeed animals use, for regulating their temperature. You can move, just as we can move to the bank in a hot country, uh, to go and get some nice cool air conditioning. So animals will move into the sun or into the shade according as they need to regulate uh, their temperature. And all the things like lizards, for example, uh, that's their principal mechanism for regulating body temperature. They don't have shivering and sweating. They just have to cope as best they can. They're very good at it. Now, sweating is the principal means of heat loss once you get above about 30 <coughs> degrees ambient temperature of about 30 degrees. So it's a sympathetic nervous system response. It's a bit like stress because you can, of course, have stress sweating. If I uh, invite you to come and have a viva this afternoon in physiology, better still, straight after this lecture, I'll give you a viva, which will count. You'll probably get a bit sweaty, uh, especially if I get nasty. I, actually, I can't get nasty. I'm too, I have a nice nature. Um, but if I get somebody nasty, uh, to come and shout at you and say, you didn't really, how do you expect to do anything? You're not any good at this. Then you can feel yourself getting pretty sweaty in all sorts of places. So there is stress sweating as well. Uh, heat is lost by evaporation. Um, and humidity has an effect on that. And again, anybody who's travelled to, say, Thailand, which is a very humid part of the world, or bits of the West Indies, uh, Trinidad as opposed to the other more northerly islands perhaps, um, Sorry, we should call them states, I think, shouldn't we? Um, 
then you find the humidity varies and it's very difficult to lose heat effectively if the humidity is high because evaporation is reduced, it's less efficient. You tend to drip rather than uh, evaporate fluid from your surface, so it's much harder to maintain your temperature. So high dry heat is much easier to stand than high humid heat, so again, because of the sweating uh, response. Oh, splendid. Right, let's think about metabolic rate. How fast is your metabolism? Um, I've tried very hard to be modern uh, and use modern units here, but I'm, I'm still thinking uh, big calories, kilocalories. So I've written down the conversion factor there. So you should remember that the conversion factor is about four, and you'll be near enough uh, for whichever units you want to work in. So here's your total uh, output. I put it in kilocalories per hour first, and the, in parentheses, uh, kilojoules per hour. So when you're fast asleep, <coughs> And being good, you're only churning out about 65 kilocalories an hour. That's about as low as you can go. Uh, and if you're sitting down, much as you are, uh, not doing anything in particular, using your brain uses almost no energy. So you don't get thin by thinking about it. <laughs> right? Uh, not possible. Doesn't use enough energy. Uh, you can't think that fast. You might think my brain, my mind is racing, but it's not using any calories. Uh, sitting you're using 100 uh, if you're cycling at a moderate that's to say a sustainable speed then you're using upwards of 300 calories, big calories uh, an hour and if you're climbing stairs then you use lots climbing stairs is very good so taking the lift is a bad idea to use the stairs you burn off lots of calories if you, of course if you keep walking upstairs for an hour that's yes, 1100 calories that's a lot of Mars bars folks a lot of points of stout um, so uh, you get rid of a lot of calories by climbing stairs if you don't have a heart attack of course. Uh, um, now there's a special measure that we use called basal metabolic rate BMR basal metabolic rate now, and it's measured as oxygen consumption because there is a very good relationship between the amount of oxygen you use the volume of oxygen you use and the amount of energy you're expending so that's a nice little relationship, and it works over quite a wide range of values. So we can measure that, and you measure BMR in the lab. This is a, a clinical or laboratory test, and you measure it under very special conditions. <coughs> the subject must be awake, how can you tell? Yes, I know. But relaxed, uh, must be rested, so you've got to be there lying in your nice little warm room uh, for more than 30 minutes so if there's any effect of the fact that you ran for a train or you came on your bicycle all that's disappeared everything's calmed down all the metabolism settled down again glucose and glycogen have done what they're going to do uh, you're lying down so you're not using any much energy to support your body I'm using energy standing up more energy than you are sitting down so I've got to hold all of me up it's not much of me I know um, lying down and in a warm space that is to say well in the thermoneutral zone 20, 20 to 25 degrees uh, somewhere towards the upper end of that range perhaps and having been fasting for about 12 hours that's sheer torture as far as I'm concerned but there you go um, so those are special conditions all designed to minimise metabolic rate so you can get down then uh, to 25 kilocalories per day uh, kilocalories uh, per bo unit body mass <coughs> per day or 1700 kilocalories per hour so that's, that's as about as low as you can go uh, but that's 80 kilocalories per hour notice that when you're asleep it's lower why would that be? <coughs> what's the principal source of energy? muscle when you're asleep your muscles relax so you've almost no muscles contracted. Even when you're resting, lying down in this relaxed state, iPod plugged in, soothing music, bit of the old Vivaldi. Oh, lovely stuff. Uh, missed two Brandenburg concertos this morning by coming in here to talk to you. So consider yourselves very honoured. I'll have to listen back at lunchtime. Um, so there we are. So when you're asleep, it's actually lower than basal metabolic rate. Now that's counterintuitive. It's not what you might expect, but the answer is muscle tone. That makes a nice little question, doesn't it? 
think I even tried to write a couple like that over the last couple of years. Oh, it must have been last year, because I think I only did this course last year. Uh, thermoneutral zone. What's, the thermo what's meant by thermoneutral zone? Get some wonderful definitions of thermoneutral zone from students. It's the normal temperature of your hypothalamus. Oh, God. It's the normal range of temperatures in Dublin in midwinter. Or, you know, also unbelievable answers. It's the range at which vasomotor tone can regulate body temperature. That's it. It's a physiological definition. It's none of the other things. It's none of your diurnal variations in temperatures. That's what it is. Vasomotor tone in the skin. So, outside that. So, that's the par a little apparent paradox there, but we can explain it in terms of our own simple variables. Oh, yes. So, muscle is about... Mm, come back. A bit twitchy there, Tuffery. Uh, muscle is about 40% of the total, and the nervous system is only about 25%. So, your brain doesn't do a lot. Uh, oh, splint. Now, um, this is a complicated diagram. Do not panic. You will not be asked to reproduce it. This is by way of illustration. And when you take the bits of the, these complicated diagrams, you take them slowly, you can manage. You know all about this stuff. So this really illustrates a slide that I had right at the beginning. There's the ambient temperature, TA, temperature of the external environment. If it falls, body temperature will also tend to fall. That is detected by the thermoreceptors. And we know where they are. They're the ones that detect core temperature in the CNS and our temperature arterial blood and there are peripheral, sorry, they detect the temperature of arterial blood because they're exposed to arterial blood uh, in the central nervous system, close to. So peripheral thermoreceptors in the skin, principally. Where else would they be? So they input, and they go to the integrating centre of the brain, uh, which is essentially in a... Ooh, Sorry, every time I pick up the mouse, it twitches. There we are. Hypothalamus there, it de detects an error from the set point. I'm going to come back to that concept of set point in a moment. So, sorry, my fingers are getting twitchy. It must be time to go and have some coffee or something. So, thermoregulatory in integrating centre, which measures error from a set point. Then you've got the outputs, and we've done nearly all of those. Sweat glands, blood vessels in the skin, and skeletal muscle. We've discussed all of those, uh, taking in one a ton of time. Skeletal muscles involve shivering, massive heat generation, rise in body temperature, negative feedback. Exciting, exciting. Blood vessels in the skin, our temperature is falling, so you need to reduce blood flow, so increase constriction. There's a kind of hidden double negative in there. Reduce the blood flow in the skin by vasoconstriction. Blood flow falls, heat loss decreases, body temperature will tend to rise. Sweat glands, um, shut down sweat production because you don't want to lose any more. Um, then, uh, so that reduces heat loss. So there we are. Uh, if you're using the new edition of German and Stanfield or you're looking at it, I haven't updated that reference number there. Uh, it's probably, it could well, it's probably the same since it's chapter one. Almost certainly as I didn't have time to check that one this morning. The new edition of German and Stanfield is called Stanfield and German. Guess who's retired, but still wants the money. Right. <laughs> Our last slide, I think. Oh, no, last but one. I might, might, might make it the last one. Fever. Fever. Q. Peggy Lee. Right. Here's our diagram. Um, you, have it, you have an infection or you have an inflammation this time of year. We've got them. Good old macrophages, which are one of the key signalling cells in the whole inflammatory <coughs> response and all that defensive mechanism. So if you get an infection or an inflammation, there's a cascade of signals goes on. Um, and the macrophages, among other things, many other things, release a thing called endogenous pyrogen. That's a real jawbreaker, isn't it? It means a molecule that makes you go get hot. Pyrogen. Pyro is fire, like pyrotechnics, fireworks. Endogenous from within. Uh, that causes prostaglandin release from various places, and that affects the set point in the hypothalamus. So you reset the thermostat. Okay. You tweak up the thermostat, so the set point is now a bit higher than it was before. And now, although your body temperature is normal, the set point is raised, so it's perceived as being low. 
Yeah? Set point has been raised. So the normal body temperature is now detected as being low. So you switch on the compensatory responses and you get heat production, shivering possibly, uh, and decreased heat loss. And body temperature goes up to the new set point and we call that a fever. Or in English we used to say having a temperature. Actually we had a temperature all the time but we never knew it. There you go. So the set point, for example, gets raised to 38.9. This is precisely the example given in Sherwood. Incidentally, I haven't done anything imaginative here. Um, oh, and the other error, incidentally, is the figure number on the slide. It says 27 instead of 17. You do not consequential. Set point is raised to 38.9. Uh, so the normal temperature is detected as too cold. So all our uh, thermogenesis is activated. Heat loss. Uh, is reduced by vasoconstriction and there is good old aspirin which I think we're not allowed to use anymore are we and it acts on that, uh, that system at this point it bro blocks uh, pro prostaglandin synthesis so it prevents the increase in temperature so that's what brings your temperature down if you take aspirin I don't know where paracetamol acts probably at the same place but I don't know uh, one of the common effects of a fever is that the fever breaks. You have a, a sweaty time uh, and the fever then dissipates. But it's pretty nasty for a little while while the fever breaks. So the set point is now restored. The set point drops back to normal. Um, and so the current temperature of the core, because you've got a fever, is now raised up to 38.9. or 38 It's too high. So you switch on the cooling mechanisms. The sweating mechanisms kick in. So next time you have a cold or a uh, man flu or something, um, uh, men get flu, women get chills or sniffles or something, don't they? Um, then that's what's happening. So wait for that. And when you get that delightfully sweaty moment when you're beginning to be on the men, temperatures, uh, the set point is just dropped. And so you're, you're probably going to live. Okay, I shall stop there. 40 sec 20 seconds early. Thank you very much. See you another day. Good day. Thank you.